Fred Melvin tell me that he had COVID. Hi, Fred. Hi, how are you? I'm so, so happy to see you again. I'm so happy to see you again. Why is it that I haven't seen you since the last time we sat down three years ago? I don't know. That's I, well, wrong, was, I, Fred. I, 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 well, there was a significant period of time when I didn't uh, leave the house at all. Um, because? Because COVID was rampant and I was afraid of getting it. And what happened, Fred? Well, ultimately, uh, I wound up getting vaccinated, double vaccinated. And right. after I had my two vaccinations, I began uh, French kissing people in route. <laughs> and uh, apparently I was a little too liberal with my, you know, idea that I was safe. <laughs> and so I was living, I had my, during the, it was a long story, during the COVID, <laughs> after the COVID lockdown, my wife and I got divorced. So I'm now living alone. So I was Sorry. living with my two boys. I have two almost 20 year old twin sons who were living with me in an apartment and we all got breakthrough and we had all been vaccinated and all got breakthrough infections of COVID the day that I, and it just seemed like a cold, like a, like a bad cold. How long ago was this, Fred? Was this Omicron? This was during the summer, was this, this was July. So it was before Omicron, you got like yes. the Delta thing. This was Delta, okay. exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was like having a cold and I, I, didn't, I didn't think it was, I just thought I had a cold. Right. And both of my kids had it. And I said to my son, Lee, I said, at one point I said, do you think this might be COVID? And he said, well, he, he said, you know, I don't feel that sick. Uh -huh. said, but I've noticed I, my smell is not, my sense of smell is pretty, uh -huh. pretty vacant. I said, yeah, mine too. And I was, and that, but I was already better. I was pretty much better. Uh -huh. But I was supposed to start uh, on this show that I'm now on, Barry, on HBO, this wonderful Ooh, show. That we'll talk I about. love it, yes. So that week I was supposed to start. And of course, when you, every, when you start, you have to be uh -huh. COVID tested and they're very rigorous about testing all the right. time. And I came back with a positive COVID test. So uh, I, ha and I thought, oh gosh, I'm going to lose this job because, you know, I can't do this now. And they were, on the contrary, they were very nice about it. And they said, we'll push all your stuff back for two weeks, 10 days oh. or two weeks so that uh, I was able to do it. And I was fine. Um, but it was, uh, I I'm very glad that I was vaccinated. Uh, double vaccinated, now triple vaccinated, about to be quadruply vaccinated. Me, okay, I want to talk to you about that. Are you going to do the the fourth the the fourth shot? Yes, I am. I'm almost sixty six years old. I have asthma. I have high blood pressure. Um, and uh, why not? There's no reason not to for me. Well, the Except only thing is, they are saying some things about maybe there's a why not, at which none of it makes sense to me. But uh, uh, why not in the sense that you might have a reaction or something? Else? Uh, they're not sure that it really is going to keep us m more protected. From, it turns out if you get the Moderna boost, fourth booster, Israel found, you'll only be 11% less likely to get morbid COVID. And the Pfizer, I was a, a Moderna person, the Pfizer is only, it, the Pfizer's only 33% less chance. Uh, and But they also said that if we keep taking these boosters, this particular, we might not we might get resistant to the one that they're going to develop that's really going to knock the shit out of it. Oh, you've obviously read much more about this than I have. I am Let's COVID see. crazy, Fred. Well, okay. I mean, there's, there's listen, the, uh, we'll talk about this uh, in, in more depth, but I have, I had three friends die from this. The people that I knew very well. Oh, Fred. So for I'm me, so this was sorry. very, re and other, other people got very sick that I knew well, and glad, glad yes. they recovered. But for me, this was not some speculative off in the distance thing this affected no. me personally yes because friends of mine died yes. so i was very very you know scared of it yeah um too. anyway uh so we'll, you know we can talk about it further but uh i haven't i you're obviously much better informed about it than i am because i haven't read those those provisos that you well I, i'm i'm literally covid crazy and also people very close to me my mother my brother and uh uh, another really close friend all got the booster and two weeks later got Omicron, all three of them. But I bet they, 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 they were, it was a mild case. You right? know, actually my brother, not so much. My brother was sick for about a month. I mean, he wasn't in the hospital. He wasn't on a respirator. He could breathe, but he had lots of issues. Well, you know, it's a very, I, I, obviously this is something that's been talked about to death, but it's a very idiosyncratic, strange illness, mm -hmm. which affects different people inexplicably differently or so far inexplicably different absolutely i have one friend a woman friend who i went to high school with who is you know my age she's 65 mm -hmm. in very good health and she got it and she's just said i feel like i have a cold it's no big deal right and she was on a respirator 
for <gasps> about uh, three weeks. And she's fine now. Yeah. And I have other friends that had what they thought were mild cases and have a, and now have long COVID where they have these oh. sequelae, these you know various problems that seem to persist for long, long after they're better. Uh, so it's a very, very complex, uh, potentially complex uh, disease. And, you know, I'm all for uh, avoiding it if, if at all possible. One of, one of our viewers, uh, Marge, uh, w got it very early. She, she, went, she went to get an MRI. We were talking about MRIs and everybody in the waiting room got it and the staff had it. And she has had heart and lung issues. incapacitating issues for, uh, it's two years now. Yeah. So there's a reason. So are you, so tell me what your life is like now. So do you feel like we're out of it? Do you walk around without a mask? Do you go into the supermarket without a mask? What yes, are you doing? I go everywhere without a mask. <gasps> no, I don't you wear, do? I don't, I don't, yes. I don't wear a mask anywhere except where I'm required. And where I live in Los Angeles County, there are very few places that are required. You're still required on certain sets uh -huh. where I work to wear masks because if somebody gets COVID on a set, mm -hmm. it presents, we'll get into this, I'm sure later, uh, but it presents unique problems because uh, there's so much money involved that if somebody gets sick hell yeah have to stop production right uh, that's a major major problem so they're ex they're very assiduous about testing and also about wearing masks and so, so forth but in my personal right life, um, i don't wear a mask uh, unless it's required of me now do you, but you know of people i'm sure because we all do have who have gotten covid again and again i mean i know people that have had it three times uh i i not sure if I know anybody that's gotten more than once, but they're, I'm sure oh. there must be. I, I mean, I, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of my personal friends, but I'm uh -huh. sure there are plenty of people who have. Yeah, there are. So, do you feel do you feel like you're out of the woods that that couldn't happen to you? No, <laughs> no I, <don't. laughs> I, I, I feel like that. I, like I've had it, uh -huh. and it wasn't so bad in me. That doesn't mean mm. a different variant could be worse. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, at this point until if there's, when, when cases start to turn up in Los Angeles at a, at a greater level, right. uh, I will have no problem, you know, going back to wearing a mask if, um, that seems judicious. Um, you know, it's, I, because I have asthma to start up, this is a right. fucking boring thing talking about <laughs> health, health problems Two the old juicing and I'm talking about all our health problems. No, but you don't understand. That's exactly what our audience <laughs> wants our audience. to hear. That's okay. what, that's what, that's what they're here for. <laughs> okay. Uh, because I have asthma, I, breathing through a mask is particularly uncomfortable for me and nobody mm -hmm. likes it. Right. But it's particularly uncomfortable. So, but I, but when it's, when it's wise, I do it. I did it for a long time. I was very angry at people who didn't do it. Right. I thought they were very selfish and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this in another context, in the context of what happened at the Academy Awards and so on. But as you know, the, well, I don't know. Should we talk about that or should we talk I, about I, I think we should go there, I, Fred, okay. because it's the-, it's the Because it's no the, one else is talking about it. <laughs> well, no, but it's the Will Smith elephant in the room. I mean, we there, come on. It's what everybody's thinking about right now still. Well, I mean, I, I I want to talk about it with a certain proviso, and I'll explain the proviso. Okay, sure. So, I'm loath to express certain opinions about it, and I'll explain to you why. Because okay. if, for example, the upshot of this is, mm -hmm. as I think it might be, mm -hmm. that Will Smith's career is forever altered because of it. I so agree with you. Then, you know, he has major projects in line at... Netflix and I think Disney Plus. I can't remember exactly what, but he has a, you know, big, very big features and also television shows. Sure. And I have many, many friends and coworkers mm -hmm. out of the thousands of people that those things employ. Right. That, that if that show, if those shows get shelved, that affects not only Will Smith, but these many, many friends and and people that I care about. So this is a complex um, issue. Yes. Also, it it's it's the way I view it. It's very, very unfortunate all around. It's unfortunate Absolutely. all around. And I think, I'm not saying anything very sage, but I think it's the truth that he made a, a, an error, a serious error in judgment. Oh. And a very, very quick judgment. Mm -hmm. It and wasn't as quick as we think, though, because there was the moment when he was laughing at the joke before he looked at Jada. Well, you know, it appeared that way, but I don't, he may, I, we don't know exactly what, what transpired. I know it seemed that he was laughing at the joke and then he looked over at his wife. And oh, maybe, so you're saying he might've been laughing at something else and then He might possibly? not have even heard the joke. You know, you, mm. when you're sitting at the Academy Awards and the guy, the presenter makes a joke, you, 
you go like that. Right, so right. I, I don't even, I, I don't, I don't even know. But my point is that that's a good point. People, people do have to pay for errors in judgment. That's part of the way life works. Now, there's a whole larger discussion, which this begs to me, right. which is, which is, should people who behave in ways that we don't admire be excoriated from society and should their work no longer be work that we embrace? Okay, so, so let's for, look at another, let's look at another, oh, you're gonna give me an example, good, good. Yeah. I mean, the obvious examples are people like Roman Polanski, some people, Woody Allen, Allen, although Woody, although Woody yes. is, I know Woody for many years. I don't, I, I, I have no special knowledge of the situation. I don't think he did what he's accused of, but that's just I, my opinion. I wanted to ask you about that yeah. as well. Okay. But okay. So I think the truth of the matter is mm -hmm. if we were to really examine the lives of the great contributors to our culture, Goethe, mm -hmm. Shakespeare, Mozart, mm -hmm. Einstein, Freud, many others, Mm -hmm. um, we would have very few people whose work we could embrace anymore. Because <laughs> to err is human. And yes, well, not only that, um, the, I'm not saying there's, any, there's necessarily any connection between genius and being an asshole. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think that, that you have to be one to be the other at all. But mm -hmm. I also think that just like anything else, there's no... I used to think when I first started out in show business that that the really big stars were all nice because it was only the guys that were struggling that had to be nasty to prove to you how great they are. It turns right. out that isn't that isn't true. The truth of the matter is many big stars are very nice and many big stars are not. Uh -huh. It has it, it's it's nothing to do with that. It's it's just like anybody else. Just like some teachers are really nice and some teachers are really not. It has nothing to do with with how right. successful how they've been how, how their efforts have been met by the public. Right. So my view is, you shouldn't dismiss someone's work um, because they've behaved in a way that you find uh, uh, not admirable. But Fred, what about but, okay. in the case of someone like Mel Gibson, where you know completely anti-Semitic? I, I don't want to get into the whole thing, but I'm just saying that for me. I couldn't watch him anymore. I just couldn't. Well, people are different about that. I was, I've been in two movies with him and uh, I know him as a person mm -hmm. and he's a person that I like. Mm -hmm. Anti-Semitic okay. anti uh, rants that he's made, uh, notwithstanding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, I'm was, not, and I'm not a Jewy Jew at all. I just don't like racism. Who's to say who was a Jew? <laughs> I wasn't bought mitzvah either. And my father was a Hebrew teacher. So I know we have that in common, but anyway. Um, so in the, let's talk so, about Woody Allen for a second. Seven movies with Woody Allen. You've done more Woody Allen movies than anybody except Mia Farrow and Diane Keaton and Woody himself. So you know the man very, very well. So Well, I don't think that's exactly fair. I mean, well, I, that's I, know him in a, I know him in a certain yes. way, in a certain you know, context. But I, I, I think I know him in a, somewhat personally. Now, here, here's a very unusual person, okay? He's mm -hmm. an unusual man and a very strange person to wind up being a filmmaker because mm -hmm. he doesn't like being around people. <laughs> uh, he doesn't. And no. the nature of making films is the most collaborative art form that there is. It's all day long, people running up to you saying, uh, should we use this one or this one? Uh, we can't get such and such an actor. Can we use this actor? What do you think about this? What do you think about this? It's you're bombarded with people. Oh my God. I, I did a play. I don't know if I ever told you this story before when we, when we talked before. Uh -huh. I did a play on, on Broadway some years ago. Uh, it's a long story, <laughs> which That's I was okay. actually fired from. Wait. But uh, wait, wait, what, wait, wait, what were you fired from? Tell us. Well, it's a long story. But it was a play on Broadway and mm -hmm. it was three one acts uh, called Relatively Speaking. And one of them was by Woody. And I already knew him well from having been in his films and stuff. Right. And we were sitting talking one night backstage and he said to me, you know, truthfully, if I could just write movies, just write my movies and go and have a nice piece of fish every night and watch a basketball <laughs> game and let somebody else make them, I would be thrilled. But I don't trust other people to make them. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that's why he persists and always persisted in, make, in making movies. I think a lot of people that are alive today, young people, mm -hmm. don't know. I think they look at him as a creepy old guy. Mm -hmm. And I think they don't know 
that obviously this this is a, an opinion of mine of mine right. but of many people that he was one of the greatest filmmakers who has ever lived but if without I could any get doubt, my, if okay. I could get my kids to watch bananas and take the money and run and sleep or I can't get my kids to watch those movies I, and they're grown-ups I can't get them to watch he, them. he made movies in his I mean you're, that's very early period I, I in his middle period movies it's uh, Annie Hall the ones that you yeah, Annie Hall Hannah and his sister. Those movies are among the greatest movies ever made. I don't think there's they any are. doubt about that. It was well, he won an Academy Award finally. Yes. Yeah, well, but it was but as we know, that doesn't necessarily no, not a correlation necessarily. But he's a, he was a brilliant filmmaker. Yes. And in my view, greater than Chaplin, because he also, there's another thing to know about Woody, which is that Oh, that's an interesting, that's a provocative statement. Well. Chaplin's work to me is filled with this kind of self pity that Woody's is not. Absolutely not. Total self deprecating. Yeah. Right. He, he punches everybody else, makes fun of everybody else, but he spares not himself ever. I agree. Ever. We, we have something in common too, because both of our fathers took us to see played against Sam when we were about the same age. Yes. Yes, and, well, uh, I, my dad was very close friends. I think I told you this already yes. with uh, Tony Roberts's father, Ken Roberts. So I went backstage and got to meet Woody and everything. And <sighs> oh I was, God. you know, it was super exciting for me. And Jerry Lacey, the guy who in Play It Again, Sam, there was a character that was supposed to be uh, Humphrey Bogart, played by an actor uh, called Jerry Lacey. And my father had employed Jerry Lacey in some show. My father made, made a couple of television shows. So he knew him. Car 54, where right, car 54. are you? <laughs> and he also made a show, uh, Phil Silver's show called Sergeant Bilko. Anyway, yes. um, so it was super exciting for me to, to meet all these people that I'd just seen in this play. So that was a big, you know, exciting thing. But the point that I wanted to make about Woody. Okay, wait, wait, before you go to your point about Woody, when you did start working with Woody, did you tell him that? Yes, but I, he didn't remember. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was so long before. You know, oh, I was, of course. It was, that there was I, I I that was when I was twelve or thir- I was twelve I yes. think and then mm-hmm. I made my first movie with Woody when I was twenty, it was nineteen eighty six so I've been thirty. Not yeah. that much later, but yeah, significantly <laughs> for him to remember, yes, significantly yes, later, certainly. yes. <laughs> remember okay. me? I was through the acne and all that. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so uh, but he he's a very unusual guy. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I don't think that he did what he's accused of, but I'll never know the truth of that. I'll never know the truth. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me, but I also think, and this is again, my opinion, mm-hmm. he took a kind of moral high ground stance with a lot of things, including Hollywood. You mm-hmm. know, he was very, you know how we, all this stuff about, I don't like to go out to LA and it's all bullshit and all that kind of stuff. I think if he, I think, I think his pre, that slightly preachiness about his attitude mm-hmm. about Hollywood Mm-hmm. made his ultimate roasting much more delicious to certain to certain <laughs> parts of the critical population and of the movie making population. I mean this is what I honestly think. I think you're correct. <laughs> but but he was he was a great, you know, was and maybe still is one of the greatest filmmakers who has ever lived. Mm-hmm. I agree. And I think I think pe- it's unfortunate that people young people think of him as this creepy old man uh instead of, you know, what he actually is. Well, so just before we went on the air, you were saying from your personal experience, I believe you said, well, you tell us what you said, not what I heard. You don't think that Woody uh, is responsible for all that he is accused of, I think is what you said. Well, I mean, we're talking about one specific event that he's accused of. I mean, there there are other things he's accused of. He admits openly he did have an affair with a very young girl. There's Mm -hmm. no question about that. I'm not talking about Sunni. I'm talking about right. another young woman who wrote a book about it, mm-hmm. uh, who, who uh, you know, also wrote a book about, she also wrote a book about it in which she describes herself as having thrown herself at him and her mother being sort of uh, a co-conspirator, if I can. On board, yeah. Kind mm-hmm. of a, you know, a, a, nevertheless, that's shocking to some people. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, I, I think people that have... Um, I, I, people that have, obviously everybody has their own feelings about things, but I think people that work with him and then say, I wish I hadn't worked with him or, um, mm. you know, I t- that kind of thing uh, seems uh, ugly to me. Mm. Now, there's another 
I mean, this, this begs many, many issues, but we're going to talk about, I think we're going to talk about Bill Hader in a minute. Now it's an interesting, we are interesting um, sort of um, similarity. Oh, um, Ooh, I not, wasn't not, expecting not, that. Not, I, don't, I, I, don't mean, I don't. I mean, as an auteur, I don't mean as, a, as, a, as a, someone accused of molestation. I mean, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Well, let me tell you a little bit about. But I'm going to change subject completely. Okay. We'll go back to money. Okay. Okay. So I've, I've been working for the last uh, half a year on Barry. I can't tell HBO. you how much I love Barry, and I am so excited that you. Gonna... Thank you. Me too. I w- I loved that show before I was ever on it. I just thought it was terrific, and I was so Fantastic. excited. Uh, to be given this uh, role, and uh, Henry Winkler. So, in, in, I, I, I can't tell you too much about it, but I will okay. tell you a very little bit, a bit about okay. it. This is the upcoming season, the third season of Barry, which drops, I believe, on the twenty fourth of, of April. I believe it is. Oh yay! It's soon. Oh yeah. yay! Yeah. So, in this upcoming season, I, and I, obviously, I can't give away too much. Right. Um, but uh, things change significantly for many people, including. Hmm. Um, uh, b- both of the lead characters on the on the oh, show, yeah. Henry Winkler's character, who has been mm-hmm. a longtime drama teacher, mm-hmm. kind of precipitously becomes sort of a star, sort of un- unexpectedly. And I play Henry's longtime agent, who has put up with his uh, being difficult and kind of you know a pain in the ass and not booking things for a long time. And then all of a sudden. He has this enormous blow up where we come and, and have to sort of shepherd him through that. So that's how yeah, you're going to be so wonderful in that role. I can't oh, wait to, sweet see to say it. that. I hope, you I, hope, are. I hope you're right. I'm so sure. I knew Henry before we, we were mm-hmm. friends before because I had done a show with him called Children's Hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were already friends and we share th- we share a lot of things in common. Uh, first of all, uh, we we we're both kind of the same in that we both are kind of like regular people who, who are actors. <laughs> I don't know if that, that makes sense. We're, we're, yes. uh, we share that with Meryl Streep, if I can be so, so presumptuous as to say that, mm-hmm. you know, we're people who are interested in things besides acting and we have, we have kind of lives and, but we happen to have a, a, an, a, an enthusiasm for and a talent for acting. Mm-hmm. So Henry is like that also. Henry writes books. He does all kinds of things. He's a big fly yes. fisherman. He's mm-hmm. uh, and he's a very bright, interesting guy. A very the sweetest guy you'll ever meet. And he had this unusual experience of being a gigantic star in the seventies, mm-hmm. and then being, you know, like many other people, like William Shatner and other people, very much locked into that and you know right. became a director because of that and all that anyway i was friends with henry already also we both are jews from new york upper west side you know both went to yale new people in common and so on anyway so we were already friends but are I you had... uh, are you i'm trying to remember how old henry no is. he's I, about I to... he's about nine or ten years older than me yeah that's what i thought okay. but we still knew many people in common uh-huh um bill Hader was somebody that i had admired but never met Except I met him once at the at the uh, Independent Spirit Awards, just for you know, just to say hi, kind of thing. Right. And so he hired me to 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 be on this part. And he's a- Ex- wait. Excuse me, one second, Fred. Were you were you picked out for? The, did you have to audition for it? Was it something that he wrote for you? How did that happen? No, I am I am pleased to tell you that I do not audition very often. Uh, anymore. I love that so much. You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, if there's a, if there's something that I really want because mm-hmm. it's something I really want to work with, or the part is really wonderful, or there's a great deal of money at stake, or something else mm-hmm. that's really compelling, I do it, but I rarely do it, to be frank. I don't think so, you've done it I've, for a long time. I have, I always ask because I've always, I've also been shocked by some of the people that still audition. I've well, listen, shocked, there are so. some people who really, you know, you could be a great actor and well known as a great actor, but you really mm-hmm. want to work with whoever, you know, look, yeah. if Paul Thomas Anderson said to me, well, Fred, uh, I know who you are, but I have to see you read. Uh, <laughs> believe me, I go in. <laughs> yeah. Believe me. Yeah. Uh, you know, it all depends on what the uh, circumstances are anyway. But the truth about this particular role was mm-hmm. uh, I already knew Henry and the guy who's the other co-creator of the show um, is a guy called Alec Berg. Mm-hmm. who uh, has been around a wonderful, really, really creative guy who I knew from working on Curb Your Enthusiasm, one of the creators of Curb Your Enthusiasm. He also is one of the creators of Friends, producers of Friends and writers of Friends. 
And um, I also worked on him uh, with him on um, two Sasha Baron Cohen movies. And so we, we know each other for a while. Yes. So uh, they kindly just uh, offered me this uh, part. Fantastic. So, uh, yes, it, I was, I don't believe me, I was thrilled to, thrilled to do it and really, really enjoyed doing it. And I got to know Bill as a result mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And he's, he fascinates me because here's a guy who is an unbelievably gifted performer to me. Mm -hmm. I think he's great. I think, I so think too. he's one of the best in the, in the history mm -hmm. of Saturday Night Live, which is a story history. He's one of the best people that's ever been on it. And his Stefan character will go down in history forever and ever and ever and ever. <laughs> yeah, he's brilliant. hysterical. And he's, <laughs> he's, he's, hysterical. he's great. He's also very good at doing dramatics. He's a very good actor. If you look at he Barry is. and you he look is. at other films that he's made, mm -hmm. he's a really, really talented actor. Mm -hmm. He does not like performing. He does not like acting. Now, what? No, I'm telling you the truth. I, maybe that's too broad to say he doesn't like it, but it's not what he, it's not his, what his real love is, his real interest is. He's an auteur writer director. Mm -hmm. His heroes are kind mm -hmm. of like who my heroes are. The aforementioned Paul Thomas Anderson, Martin Scorsese, Francis Coppola, uh, many others that I could mention, uh, some not so illustrious, but you know, great. That's mm -hmm. the, and he grew up in the Midwest Mm -hmm. uh, looking at, just like Paul Thomas Anderson and other people looking at, you know, laser discs, DVDs, studying film with this kind of absolute fascination, this kind of absolute love. I read a story about him today uh -huh. um, where it, he, 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 he explains when he was on Saturday Night Live, um, uh, Maya Rudolph was on Saturday Night Live, who was, of course, married to Paul Thomas Anderson. So one time mm -hmm. Paul came into the, onto the set just for, you know, social reasons. Uh -huh. And uh, he was so, Bill was like so obsessed and enamored with him <laughs> that he, he like wanted to ask him, how do you do everything? How do you, how do you make this magic thing? And Paul was like, you know, <laughs> you know he's, he was like, it wasn't quite, you know, leave me alone, but it was something you know, <laughs> close to that. Like, like, you know, you'll figure it out kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and he's, and Bill now says, well, you know, I do realize what he said was correct. There is no magic. The magic is in you. It's you do it. It's like you describe to somebody who's never been married or never, never had anybody. Great. What's it like to be in love? Well, you could tell them, but there's no point in telling them because, they, when they get there, they'll see. There's the, you can't describe it with any kind of accuracy. It's you, of you, you get the, it's you know it's one of those things. So you have to you have to go and use whatever it is you have when you mm -hmm. are creating. So uh, that's kind of what I think the message that he got from Paul Thomas Anderson. And now he gets to do it. So he's a person who approached performing, as I did for much of my life, with absolute terror, throwing up in the bathroom anxiety attacks, tears before every show. That guy who was oh. so funny, so talented, so good, was like shaking like a leaf. He was on that show for eight years, nine years. Wait, even on Saturday Night Live? By the time Only on Saturday, Saturday Night, Night Live. Live. He never, he Only hardly on... did anything before Saturday Night Live. Wow. He was, wow. he was, he always wanted to be a writer director. That was his thing. And then he, he came to LA when he was a young, very young kid and was a mm -hmm. PA, he was a PA on Spider-Man. He wanted to, you know, learn the film business. He's a right. PA on Spider-Man or Spider-Man 2, one of the early Spider-Man movies. And he got into, he sort of backed into this little comedy troupe thing with a, he, mm -hmm. a lot of his friends, the people that are his friends, his close friends are guys he's known like his whole life. Some of the writers on the show are people that he mm -hmm. went to, you know, grade school with out, out there. Fabulous. The right. Um, that's the kind of the way he is. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so he, he, his whole desire was to be a filmmaker, but he was living out mm -hmm. here in LA and he got into this little improv or some kind of troupe and uh, Megan Mullally mm -hmm. happened to see uh, the, the sh some little show at some little dingy, you know, theater here in LA and mm -hmm. mentioned to Lauren Michaels, the, the, the guy mm -hmm. who does like Saturday Night Live about she'd seen this guy who was so great. And mm -hmm. so Lauren brought him in, but he did not, unlike 
the vast majority of people that you see in Saturday Night Live, he was not a graduate of the, you know, the groundlings or, or uh, upright citizens right. brigade or these various training grounds that, that 90% of now people that you see in comedy come through. He had none of right. that. He was right. just, he just had this unbelievable uh, talent, but really, wow. I mean, it's turned out great because it's allowed him, but I, I really believe, and I, I say that, I don't say this about a lot of people. I really honestly believe he will go down in history as being a great filmmaker. I believe I he has, love he's, a, that. he's a young guy. He's in his, mm -hmm. like, he's like 43 or four or something like that. He's young. Well, mm -hmm. so to, from my perspective, he's young. <laughs> um, I think he's going to make some really unbelievable movies. I mean, I think he's going to be a, a, a giant in the cinema. I really think that. I love that. You heard it first here, folks. Well, I love that. did I tell you my story about Robert Downey Jr.? I don't know if I ever told you. You have before. not. No, okay. I don't think so. So I, when I was in, when I went to drama school, from 1978 at to Yale, at Yale, <laughs> 1978 to 1981, during the summers, I was mm -hmm. a counselor in a camp, a theater camp called Stage Door Stay Manor. You know, you know Stage Door Manor. I, I very, of course, who I was an actor. My daughter was an actor. Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so there's a, it, 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 it's not so well known out here in California, but on the East Coast, people, many people know it. It's a, it's a, it's a camp for kids that want to be in the theater and stuff. So I was a teacher, and, and, and also like Sarah Jessica Parker and, and Matthew Broderick, a lot of them went to stage. An Manor. unbelievable number yeah. of big stars went there. Yeah, and one of my students that I had uh, was Robert Downey Jr. There. So well. uh, then, in 1986 or seven, many years after that, or six or seven mm -hmm. years after that, um, I was in a movie with him, which was his very first movie called The Pickup Artist. I love that movie. You know that movie? James Toback <laughs> yes, movie? Yes, I do. They're yes, talking about I excoriated, do. James Toback. Okay. Anyway, so, <laughs> so, uh, so I was in this movie with, with Robert Downey Jr. And he, people don't remember, Robert Downey Jr. was on Saturday Night Live. He had been mm -hmm. on Saturday Night Live and he was dumped after a half a year. They got rid of him. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it was after half, half a year. So this was his first big thing after after the Saturday Night Live experience. And it was mm -hmm. a lead in a movie. And it had Molly Ringwald in it and Dennis Hopper. It had some big, big stars in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Robert, uh, so we were doing it. And he was very nervous, very, very nervous. And we did a scene together. It was me, him, and Mildred Dunnock. Mildred Dunnock played his grand, grandma in the movie. Mm -hmm. And we did it. And I said to him, let me talk to you for a minute. And he said, sure. I said, I don't say this very often, but I have a feeling that you're going to be a really, really big star. And he said, really? I said, honest, I really think that you just have this thing. You have this thing that comes across that certain people do. And we went to his, to his trailer and we had a pizza and talked and stuff. And so uh, when Christmas time rolls around, I, I write him a card and I say, hang in there, Robert. I know it's going to happen for you. I know it's going to happen. Anyway, that's my Robert Downey Jr. story. I, 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 once you started telling it, I, I do think you told that to me. Did you have, did you, I'm sure you've gotten to see him since. Uh, I actually only saw him very briefly once since, and it was like just for a second, so not much, no. So you didn't get to have that. Remember when I told you you didn't get to have one of those moments? No, no only in writing, not in, not mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in real life. So, okay, so Barry... You're really excited, but you've got a, you've got a bunch of things on your slate right now. We're jumping all over the place, but yes, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 Anne will not forgive me if I don't ask you about Wandavision because Wandavision is like a, a a big deal, huh? This Marvel stuff. Tell us about Wandavision. Yes, uh, well, uh, Wandavision was already a while ago, but I think it's still you can still get it on Disney Plus. Mm -hmm. uh, very interesting experience making that. It was my introduction to be part part of the MCU, the the uh, Marvel universe. Um, it's Were your boys excited about that? They're not big into uh, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Neither one of them. Mm -hmm. But I think once they got to see it, they were they they enjoyed it. They liked it. Mm -hmm. um, it was interesting because I had just I was in New York, and I was working on a very low budget little indie movie um, f with a young woman, young young auteur filmmaker, writer director um, called Emma Seligman. Um, and this movie was made on an absolute uh, shoestring. 
It's called Shiva mm-hmm. Baby. You may have heard about it. It's, you, know, I, you know, I I read about that in your bio. I don't. I have to find it. To uh, it's on. It. it was. It was on HBO. It may still. It's mm-hmm. if you get HBO Max, that's probably on I HBO do. Max. Yeah, okay. it's on there. I think. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, this was a movie. Uh, I really enjoyed making it. Uh, a lot mm-hmm. of fun to make. And uh, the woman who plays my wife in that movie, the, uh, we play the parents of the main character, mm-hmm. uh, is a woman uh, called Polly Draper that I went to drama school with many, many years ago. I remember Polly Draper. was on 30 Draper, something sure. and you might, mm-hmm. might remember her. A sure. lovely person. Anyway, um, so uh, we made this movie and this movie was literally made for, you know, nothing. You know, you go to the, the craft service table, it was like a thing of peanut butter and a thing of saltines. and <laughs> So... See what's important to me. So, <laughs> so uh, it was. I went right from that. The biggest line, their biggest single line item on that whole movie, their biggest budget thing, was flying me in from California. They had to fly me in business class and putting wow. me up in a hotel in New York for two weeks or whatever it was. That was the biggest. Wow. Thing. Anyway, so I went right from that, uh-huh. which it was great fun, but was you know you felt the every, and also because you know when you do low budget movies, you have to compress everything because you only have the the location for a very brief period of time and mm-hmm. to shoot a lot in a short time and certain actors are not available on certain days and it's mm-hmm. logistically it's hard to make movies for little money mm-hmm. you know it's very difficult so i went right from that to going to atlanta where the marvel most of the marvel stuff is made and you know on a gigantic scale and it was very revealing to me to see to go right from this little nyu students you know movie love project right the gigantic goliath uh wow. world of, of marvel where all the clothes were handmade in italy and you know <laughs> the the set that we that we worked on was bigger than the set that bigger than the house i lived in i mean it was, you know, fantastic <laughs> uh, and and uh you know interesting also interesting people and interesting uh project to work on we were talking before the show about um, a project that you've written. I don't know the status of it right now. Were you about a friend of yours that when I was hearing about it, reminded me of inventing Anna. Can you tell us a little bit about the? Um... Sure. Um, it's a script. It's called The Preservationist. That's the name of it. Mm-hmm. And it's a fictional story, but it was largely influenced by the actual story of a friend of mine, a, a guy that I was very close to in college, one of my set of five or six close uh, college friends. Mm-hmm who um, was unusual among my college mm-hmm. friends because he, <laughs> he could do anything with his hands. He, had this unu- he was incredibly creative. He could build things, make things. My friends were all very bright. You know, you could have conversations about, you know, I don't know, Gerda or something. But if you, God forbid, you had to put together a, a, a barbecue to eat dinner, you'd be <laughs> starved. You know? <laughs> And actually negotiate the real world. Um, but this guy, this, this friend of mine, uh, was incredibly gifted at that kind of stuff, as well as being brilliant academically. Um, and I, I met him because he used to build sets for, for the theater where, where I was, you know, acting as a kid uh, mm-hmm. without any kind of uh, schematics, just could build them. He's an unbelievable talent to build things. And he was kind of, um, he was an interesting person. He was a classics scholar. He's also an unbelievably talented juggler, and he had all the he was very very a uh, very big heavy guy with a long ponytail. Looked a little bit like like Pendulette, if you know what Pendulette mm-hmm. looks like. I certainly do. In the old days, I and mean, this is when we mm-hmm. went to college. Long hair and stuff. Uh, anyway, um, at the end of college, he got into a he started working at Altman's, which is a kind of a fancy department store in New York. Mm-hmm. And he worked in the rare book department and he became an expert in maps, old maps, particularly early maps of the Americas. And mm-hmm. he wrote two kinds of seminal works on the history of maps of the Americas, which are, you know, in that little, that, that, that little world of people that, to whom maps are important mm-hmm. um, are, are very well known and respected. Mm-hmm. And he became a major player mm-hmm. in that world, mm-hmm. uh, buying and selling uh, these rare maps, often maps of the Americas. And we're talking about maps that could easily be worth uh, 60, 70, hundred thousand dollars for a map. Wow. Very, very expensive. And uh, after about 25 years um, at the forefront of this being one, also this kind of larger than life, jolly, wonderful personality. Mm-hmm. After about 25 years at the, at the, at the apex of this profession, mm-hmm. he was, he was found stealing, caught stealing, 
uh, from the Beinecke Library at Yale, which is the rare book library at Yale, and eventually admitted to having stolen many millions of dollars worth of maps. Jesus. The most prolific uh, map thief in history. Wow. Now, what's so fascinating him, about him is that he didn't use much of the money for his own luxury or his own glorification. Mm -hmm. He had this strange compulsion to kind of be a rescuer. He surrounded himself with people, friends, mm -hmm. often very bright, talented people, but for one reason or another, whose lives hadn't turned out so well. Mm -hmm. um, and he thought it was his life's work to be a kind of a, an example that life was a winnable proposition. Mm. So that's what the story is about. Wow. Wow. Um, and I, I won't tell you too much about the story, except to say, for example, now this isn't now much of this is invention. It's not, you know, it's not the story of this person, but I I, I mixed some things that were my own inventions with what partly with what is true. Mm -hmm. But I mean, when we, for example, when we meet him in the story, his marriage is breaking up. And his wife in the story is an alcoholic. And she's gone to AA and has stopped mm -hmm. drinking. Mm -hmm. And he, she desperately wants him to kind of come with her on this new chapter, this new phase of her life, mm -hmm. which is so stimulating to her and so exciting. And he's not able to sleep with her uh, anymore. And there becomes this distance between them because he can only deal with her as a rescue. Once he has to see her at eye level, he doesn't know how to behave. Wow. He, ha he has this thing that if he's just a person, he'll vanish. He wasn't a Madoff who needed to get his name on the pew in the church, well, not the church, but in Madoff's case, you know, <laughs> in the temple, or needed to get, you know, his name in the paper. He didn't care about that. It was actually being a kind of a hero to people. And he, that was so, became so compelling to him that he wound up destroying his own life and the lives of many other people because of it. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that's what the story is about. So I wrote it originally as a feature, mm -hmm. as a feature. And I was talking to my manager about it, who's been very, a uh, woman that I'm very close to and you know, dear friend and very, very good with advice. She said to me, so you want to direct this yourself? I said, yes, I would only direct it myself. She said, so you're going to take, it's going to take you probably two or three years to raise the money, even if you make it cheaply. And then if you're lucky and it comes out really well, you know, maybe you'll get into Sundance. So you'll be the new hot director at Sundance. You'll be 74 years old. <laughs> and, and meanwhile, you won't make any money between now and then because you're going to, to spend all your time trying to sell this idea and make it, then raise the money to do it. So she said, how about instead of doing it as a feature, Mm -hmm. If you do it long form for television, mm -hmm. so I said, well, that's a very good idea. That's a very good idea, said I. And then I began to do, uh, I wrote an episode and I began to do a, what's called a Bible, which is kind of mm -hmm. like a, um, a description that tells about the, w w what the trajectory of the characters are, what they should look like, what the mm -hmm. sets are like, kind of a, kind of a, a, a hands-on description of everything about the show. Mm -hmm. So I wrote that. Um, and then I, then I started to be so busy with acting uh, jobs and stuff that Yay. I just kind of, kind, well, yeah, I, I, was, I was, you know, happy about that. But I just kind of, I just kind of didn't work on it anymore. And then I, you know, to be truthful with you, I find writing very, very difficult, very difficult. And I like acting, <laughs> unlike, <laughs> unlike Bill. I, I actually like, I actually enjoy acting mm -hmm. and it suits me because uh, in my own, left to my own resources, I tend to be rather solitary mm -hmm. and I like the sort of foxhole atmosphere of acting where you get to know people really well, you're thrown together, you work long hours and you're dealing with emotional stuff. So you, you, um, you know, it's, it's sort of part and parcel of it that you get to know people deeply. Mm -hmm. And I like that because by myself, I don't do that very well easily or very well, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, and I like the fact that I can put it all into, into behavior mm -hmm. instead of just thought, because my natural thing is to think about everything instead of doing anything. Um, so I, I like acting. Um, writing is very, very hard. And I have enormous respect 
for people that are good at writing. It's it's really hard to do. I wrote a book. Did you? I yes, and it was a and Carl Reiner published it, and uh, it was an Amazon bestseller. And so I like to write. Yes, I'll send you. I'll send you one. Good for you. That's great. Yeah, yeah. It was. It was. It yeah. I love to write, but but I understand what you're saying about it's. But it is very very difficult, and the discipline of it is very very difficult. And then. I thought, well, once COVID, once the COVID uh, lockdown came around, this was, mm-hmm. I guess, like two and a half years ago. I, I forget exactly, but two years uh, okay. exactly, pretty much. Yeah, you're right. It's March, right? But mm-hmm. it's right, yeah. two years. I said, okay, great. Well, now I'll work on it. And then uh, things in my marriage began to uh, deteriorate, and various other problems started. So I was not very disciplined about it, to be frank. Fred, I have been talking to more people who have. I, I did. I haven't cleaned out a closet, filed a paper. I had two years to take care of everything I've been wanting to do, and I did none of it. So I feel. Well, you. I mean, I think it was. A, it was a hard time for a lot of people. It's funny. Mm-hmm. I, I had to div- hire a divorce attorney, of course, to get divorced. And uh, she, 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 she said to me, just so you know, um, we're booked ahead for about four years now. This, is, <laughs> this prompted so many divorces. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing, uh, but that's, that's hysterical. Yeah. yeah, it's true. Oh my God. How are your boys doing with, uh, how are you working that out? Well, uh, you know, I have twin sons that are, will be 20 this year. Uh, one of them lives, uh, goes to Chapman University here in Orange. Fantastic. Uh, and he's doing wonderfully well. Mm-hmm. He started out wanting to be an actor and he was actually in a couple of films and did very well. But then he later decided that he was interested in psychology. Mm-hmm. So he's studying both uh, acting and psychology with psychology being kind of the primary thing that he's interested in. Uh, he's not, he he's fascinated with psychology in many forms other than just clinical psychology. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's interested in forensic psychology. Wow. Um, so he may go in that direction. We'll see. I, I think he'll probably wind up getting a PhD and, you know, maybe also study criminology if he, if he, if he continues with it. He's also a very good actor. It so happens, but Fantastic. Um, so he's there and our, our, my other son, our other son, um, whose name is Alec, um, has quite severe autism. Mm-hmm. So he initially went uh, to live with my wife. Uh, my wife decided to move uh, out of California for some time. So mm-hmm. he went with her, but she ultimately decided to come back because the services that, uh, where she was living were very mm. poor and, you know, she, mm. it was very hard. So she's now moved back here with him and he's doing, he's doing okay. He's back at school where he was, but as he, it's, it's hard because he's almost 20 and it's clear to me now, the older he gets, that the truth is people with the level of autism that he has, which is quite profound, mm-hmm. is uh, they don't really want to, they want to be left alone. And there's a kind of a struggle because I, you know, we want him to not be locked in this world of his own mm-hmm. um, self-stimulatory behaviors and not be able to be around people and all that kind of thing. And yet you also kind of have to let him be who he is. So there's a, it's a complex um, situation. Mm-hmm. Um, he's very sweet. Uh, uh, he's not ghost-like, like some people that have autism. I mean, he's definitely there. Mm-hmm. But cognitively, he's like a, he's 20, but he's like, he's, he's like, he's five. You know, he, mm-hmm. he likes Thomas and stuff like that. And Thomas mm-hmm. Tank Engine. And, and, you know, he, he's very, it's, he can speak. But if you ask him to describe something, uh, cogently it's very hard for him mm-hmm. you can answer a question if you say you know how are you or something mm-hmm. but if you say you know what do you think of school or you know uh, very hard to get an answer mm-hmm. and he would really rather just be left alone so it's and the older he gets the clearer that gets mm-hmm. so uh, you know it's 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 <laughs> it's not easy and mm-hmm. now that he's going back and forth between me and my wife, that also makes it not easy. She's not working. I work. So it's, we have to take that into consideration because I mm-hmm. still have to, you know, make a living. Um, but he's doing okay. And he's back at school where he was and he likes school. And hopefully uh, soon his services will start again. We had to wait because, um, the, you know, COVID uh, has, has brought out, as you can imagine, it's hard enough for people, typical people, but for people that don't communicate well to start off with, it's, it's you know, made life a lot more complex. So there's, they don't have the hours available that they did. 
So we're hoping to get them back. Well, I hope that somebody got on the thread before the show and said that you were very helpful to her talking with her about special needs. I guess she has a child who has special needs and how wonderful you were with her, um, which is lovely. Did you hear today that uh, Bruce Willis uh, is stepping down from his career because he yes, was diagnosed? Yes, I did. I read about it. So that's really, uh, th that is, to, I can imagine Bruce Willis not being able to understand or communicate that. I don't know anything well, I mean, about I aphasia. Think I, think there's, I think there's a long time. I mean, I don't know the progress of his disease, mm -hmm. but I, I would I would expect, I certainly hope and would expect that there might be a very long time between he gets to what between now and he gets to the point where that really becomes, uh, you know, impossible for him. I know that, or I've heard that he has some trouble with lines, uh, and that may, uh, you know, that may affect also his um, his desire to work or his ability to work. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, also he has a he has a youngish kids. He has a family, mm -hmm. so he may be. Th you know, I, I read the, the sort of explanation that he gave, and he said, "Look, uh, you know, I want to. I maybe it was that his wife gave. I don't remember. Uh, you know, we want to enjoy what time we have where he is still able to do things. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't blame him. He's got enough money that he doesn't have to uh, mm -hmm. he doesn't have to uh, worry about it." And I, I, I would, if I had a diagnosis like that um, and I had the money to do it, I would certainly want to spend time with my loved ones and not mm -hmm. worry about working if I, if I had that choice. Uh, don't get me wrong. I, I love working too, but um, you know, I'm knock on wood. Uh, uh, I'm mentally <laughs> relatively okay, <laughs> but I, just, I, I, I have problems with memorization that I didn't, that I was I, just going to ask you that because the we last talked time, about it. I, the last talking, time I asked, you, you told me you didn't that you really didn't have a problem it's, it's not it's not i it's not a major problem i mean i can do it but i what happens is there are certain words that for some reason i can mm -hmm. never remember i'll have a speech and i'll remember most of the speech and there's a right. point i'll get to where a certain word is supposed to be in there and i can't remember the word and instead i'll put in another word but it's not the right word um and you know, I, I don't, I'm not educated enough about cognitive function to know what's really happening. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, the, the, the way this works is there's a, there's a, if you imagine that it's a library, <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, your ability to make new memories is what gets affected. That's why everybody who's old can remember <clears throat> vividly what happened when they were in grade school. Right. <clears throat> but if you ask them what they had for lunch or something, you know, more recent, it might be mm -hmm. harder. Mm -hmm. So um, there are certain words that for me are trouble. So I have to use mnemonic tricks, usually tricks with, with visuals to remind me. So the, the whole key to memorization for me, and this is mm -hmm. you know, no, no big, a lot of people know this, you have memory, uh, you do memory tricks like memory mm -hmm. artists and stuff. You use visual things because the because Such brain, as, can you give me an example? Yeah, okay. So- Okay. Um, give me any three things, any three objects. A chair. Okay, number one. Hold on. Number one is a chair. Okay. okay. What's number two? Pillow. Okay. What's number three? Painting. Okay. So if I, if I ask you the numbers of the things, could you tell me what it is? Number one is a chair. Number two is a pillow. Number three is a painting. What's number two? A pillow. What's number three? A painting. Good. Okay. So was that good? Because my father had Alzheimer's, so I'm really freaked out about this stuff. Okay. So one is a gun, two is a shoe, three is a tree. Okay. This is oh, a no, memory no, no. trick. I won't be able to do this. So don't ask oh, okay. me. So one is a gun. Okay. So it's a gun, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm using a picture of the gun. So two is a shoe. I'm thinking the shoe stepping on the pillow. Three is a tree. Somebody's painting a painting under a tree. So the visual, right, helps you remember. I can do this with numbers up to about 15. Wow. Well, I mean, it's no big deal. You learn. I, I've never, no, I, my husband is a mentalist. I've never heard of this tricks. This Really? Yeah. I don't know about this. So that's interesting. Yeah. So th th this is an old trick for, 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 for memorizing lists and things like that. Mm -hmm. So if I, for example, if I have a trouble with a particular word, I'll try and do a word before it and make a memory bridge that is visual. 
So give me, can you give me an example of that? <laughs> I can't I'm remember sorry, but I can't I'm, remember I'm, anything to tell you. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. this okay. is really so interesting. Example, so I'm trying to, because okay. I need so, work so on so my let's memory. Say the, <laughs> let's say the line I have to remember is, now is the winter of our discontent made glorious by that summer sun of York. Oh, that's okay. So that's the line I have to remember. Okay. Now is the winter of our discontent. So I can't remember the word discontent, right? I can't remember. Now is the winter of our, 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 dis, our, now is the winter of our, so I'm thinking in winter, there's a tent, right? It's winter time <laughs> and there's a tent because it's the Civil War and they have to sleep in tents and it's a snowy evening. I'm thinking how cold it is to walk outside the tent. Now is the winter of our tent, our discontent. I, I get this. And when I was a little kid, I had to learn capitals and stuff. And I couldn't remember Caracas, Venezuela. My father said in Venezuela, people eat Caracas and milk. And here it is 60 years later. And I still remember it yeah. because it was that kind of just so making it. A, yeah. The reason why is if you were to take a, a schematic and show your brain, mm -hmm. This much of your brain is, is devoted to pictures and this much of your brain is devoted to language. Is that true? Yes, it's absolutely true. Wow, I had no clue. Um, by the way, Tony says that Bruce completed work on eight films to be released between now and 2023. So we're gonna have a lot of Bruce Willis coming up, which is- Well, lovely. I think maybe he knew what was going on. Oh, you do? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, think, uh, I think he, you know, he wanted to, I'm sure there were certain projects that he wanted to make. Mm -hmm. Also, if I were him, I don't know if this is true, but if I were him, I would want to make a nice stash of cash mm -hmm. that I wouldn't uh, have to con be concerned about my family and whatever, you know. Go of course. That's what I would do. So let's take this back to where we started. Uh, we're not done, but I, I want to go back to Will Smith because we were talking also before we started, we came on the air about Will and what you project might be the offshoot of this behavior. Okay, so what the thing, the, the, the point that I was trying to make before was, I'm, I'm a little bit loath to discuss it just because I don't want to affect, if Will Smith's projects get messed up mm -hmm. or canceled or shelved or changed, that affects not only Will, but many, many other people. I, I see. People that I'm mm -hmm. concerned about, right? Mm -hmm. People that I work with, friends of mm -hmm. mine. Mm -hmm. So it has a complicated... Um, so yeah, you don't want to put anything out there that can have any influence. I get you. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, not, not that I'm so influential. <laughs> but, okay, so, here, so here's what I think. Mm -hmm. Even though I said earlier in the show that I don't think we should judge artists' work mm -hmm. by what we think of their actions as human beings, mm -hmm. I think this is a special situation because he did something within the context of his work itself mm -hmm. that was so unbelievably disrespectful mm -hmm. to... Um, the people who were there, the people that are the audience, the people, the, the, the very people fetting him on this mm -hmm. occasion. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, the truth is, uh, let's be honest about it. As I said to you earlier, uh, the, the, the marriage between art and commerce mm -hmm. uh, is a shotgun marriage mm -hmm. and it's not uh, art that holds the Remington. <laughs> so uh, that complicates everything because the people who make the Oscars Mm -hmm. I mean, the Oscars are about money, right? Mm -hmm. why, do, why, does, why do people campaign so much for Oscars? I mean, it's not because they want to get, it's not because Will has an ego or not, I'm sure he does, but I mean, the, his movie company mm -hmm. wants him to get an Oscar mm -hmm. because that movie, although that was made for, I forget, it's a streamer, I think, isn't it? I don't remember. I think now mm -hmm. streamers have become so, you know, I know, yeah. I know that. Was I don't a, know. If, yeah. I think it might've been a streamer. I think it came out. Yeah. I think I it was. can't remember. I know Coda was made for a streamer for sure. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. picture that, you know, one best picture. Mm -hmm. That's quite revolutionary. I think a little mm -hmm. movie like that from a streamer, one best picture. Anyway, um, this marriage has to do with money. So the Academy is in a tough position because on the one hand, they're autonomous, but they're uh -huh. part of Hollywood too. Uh -huh. Right. So I, I think my personal guess is, mm -hmm. and this is a guess, but it's, it's mm -hmm. my guess. Mm -hmm. but I don't think his, he, I don't think he will ever be the Will Smith again. Yeah. The Will Smith that we knew. I think mm -hmm. this will demark every, all the work that he's done up to this point mm -hmm. is not going to matter as much as this thing that he did. Is, okay. So now I have another question for you as Fred Melamed, if you were at the Academy Awards on Sunday night, 
Would you have stood up and given him a standing ovation? I am so appalled. That, when he won the Oscar? Yes. That the audience of his peers did not boo him. No, I would, I, I, I would, I don't know what the hell I would have done, but I surely would have not have. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't think it would be at all surprising. Mm-hmm. I take that back. It might be surprising, but I, I, I don't think it would be at all inappropriate for them to actually strip him of his Oscar or throw him out of the Academy. But that's different because that's afterthought. I'm saying while the people, the people that the people that were there in that room that witnessed that traumatic horror show, and you know, Questlove had to go up afterwards, and his whole thing is mush now. Um, but for the people that were Nicole Kidman horrified in the moment, we all we've all seen the photograph, and yet applauding for him and well, I don't I mean, understand I, I, it. I, I, I well, I think. I mean, I agree with you, but I also think to be in that situation is so confusing. Yeah. That I think maybe they didn't really know how to react. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm just guessing this, that mm -hmm. maybe uh, it was a way to kind of make things better. Mm. Okay. You know, uh, but I, I, but I, I, I don't I, accept that that would have been my behavior, but I accept that. But I, I'll know, never I be. I, I don't think category, it would have been mine so. either. I, I think it was, you know, completely shocking mm -hmm. and you know right that it's shocking mm -hmm. i mean I, I i think that i'm not saying anything very sage or new but uh everybody first of all okay so the joke was in poor taste without any doubt i don't think mm -hmm. I, whether or not he knew that she had alopecia i think uh, there's some question about that i think it's she's been very public about it you know what i i did not know and i read a lot of rags and i know i know chris rock a little bit for a long time i have known him to be the kindest sweetest loveliest man i don't believe that he knew i really don't believe that he knew. maybe he didn't mm -hmm. um it, it's it's still you know it's a joke in bad taste but mm -hmm. what is the appropriate response to a joke in bad taste it's the Oscars. Come on. Right. That's what I mean. That's, that's what, what they do at the Oscars. Well, that's what they do. That's what comedians do everywhere. Right. So, so are people now going to get up, you know, at Mr. Laughs and say, I didn't like that joke. Uh, you said something about my wife or my wife was fat or something like that. Bam. That, that, see, that, that's, that, uh, what I'm trying to say is the idea that that's normalized. And is, it was. Is, mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't normalized except that, you know, the, Everybody applauded him. Well, Everybody applauded him. They okay. are culpable. I'm sorry, because now comics are going to get, I, I hope not. But I hope not too. I hope not too. But I, I, it's, it's, I mean, the, the say it's, it's, it's a sad, it's a sad event for everybody involved, except mm -hmm. maybe Chris Rock. And I'm sure at the time for him, it was plenty sad too. Uh, it, it's just, it's just, it's the very, All right, here, very... here's another thing I want to ask you about. I was talking about this on my show the other day. Uh, I don't care how confident and successful Chris Rock is. He is a human being and moments of extreme. He was humiliated in front of the world. And I know him enough to have seen the terror behind the eyes that he so gracefully got through but I know I can remember being six years old and reaching for a gift that wasn't for me and being told that through laughs. And I've carried it for 60 years. It was no big deal. There were only two people in the room. This is something Chris is going to have forever. This is a gift. I don't care how confident he is, how wonderful his life is. That was trauma. That was absolute trauma. I agree with you. But I also think that the public perception of it is so much in agreement with that that I think that ameliorates it to some degree because he's a performer. But I do, I, I, I it, there's no, I mean, what on earth would prepare you for that kind of response? I mean, you, I, I mean, it was amazing to me that he was able, I mean, you, if you look at the unedited footage, like I'm sure mm -hmm. everybody has, mm -hmm. you could see he's quite, you know, for a few seconds there, he's really like, what the hell? And he's a little, you know, and who mm -hmm. the hell wouldn't be? Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 I admire his professionalism and his, I don't know what to call it, his together head for be able to, you know, recover. Uh, it's a shame that he had to, 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 to even be concerned with that. I gather from what I've read that they were not on, you know, he, he said something about the 2016 Oscars, you know, about that thing that he said before, but that they knew each other. They were not at mm -hmm. all unfriendly to each other. You know, they had mm -hmm. done things together. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think, uh, to, to, you know, that's a very shocking thing. 
Um, but I think the public perception is that he handled it unbelievably gracefully. Um, and, uh, you know, um, <laughs> he, he, he was able to, to uh, he, he will be the least of anybody, probably the least harmed by it in the long term. Well, I think in the long term, he's, he's already benefited by it. All of his concerts have sold out. The next day, all of his concerts sold out. And I think for Chris, the, the, the gift of art is, and his artistry is that he will put it in his art. And mm -hmm. I think he'll have the benefit of working it out emotionally because he'll put it in his art and he'll okay. use it that way. So in that sense, he's, he's got the benefit of that. So let's talk about your art. So I, I just wanna um, go back to- hit me, are you? I'm not going to hit you. I promise. I can't. It's it's Zoom. If you were here, I can't promise that that would be the case. So, so Fred, I mean, we. I think everybody. Uh, how can we think of you and not think of a serious man? Um, what what an extraordinary film. What an extraordinary performance. Um, you, you were robbed of of an Oscar nomination at least. Uh, Should have probably taken home that statue. So how did, I know this story, but I don't know that everybody out there does. How did that happen for you? How did your relationship with the Coen brothers start? Well, it happened at a time in my life, a very propitious time in my life. I was not working very much. Um, I had moved, I lived in Manhattan, but my wife and I uh, had a country house in Montauk, which on the east end of Long Island. Uh, and when our kids were diagnosed with autism, we moved out there full time because we couldn't get any, we lived in Manhattan, but it was such an avalanche of cases in, in uh, 2004 when our kids were diagnosed that you couldn't get the services even though we were legally entitled to them. So our kids were very young, they weren't even two years old yet. Anyway, we moved out to uh, Suffolk County because there the, the, the explosion or at least the discovery of it had not yet happened so you could still get services. Wow. So we moved out there full time and in those days, I was making a lot of money. I was the voice of CBS Sports and other things and had a lovely house out there in Montauk. And, uh, but I wasn't working much. I had a, I had a, uh, uh, a home studio out there. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it, was, it was a lovely place to live, but I wasn't, it was financially tough because I had two kids who needed special help and I wasn't working. And, oh. mm -hmm. and one day I was sitting at home and the phone rang and my wife answered the phone. And she said, do you know somebody called Joel Cohen? And I knew the Cohen brothers a little bit because I had auditioned for them for uh, Barton Fink. If you remember in the movie, sure. Barton Fink, there's, a, there's a character called Jack Lipnick, who's the film executive. Mm -hmm. uh, a wonder, and the guy who actually played it was fantastic and he was nominated for an Oscar. He was wonderful. I, his name escapes, escapes me at the moment. I should know it, but I can't think of it. <laughs> I should use a picture. But uh, I can't remember. <laughs> you know, and now I'm I'm probably saying the wrong thing. But was Barton Fink? Was that John Turturro? Am yes. I wrong? Yeah. Oh, it was. Okay. Yes, that was that was mm -hmm. one of John Turturro's earliest. Uh, I he's an old friend of mine. We went to also to drama school together. Oh, fantastic! Uh, he and and also uh, uh, well, I hope many people many people next Cohen Brothers sort of coterie Fran McDormand. Well, I was just going to say you went to. School you knew Francis from school, right? Yeah. Right. She and yeah. John were in this class below me. Okay. One, one class below me. Mm -hmm. As was Jane Kaczmarek, as was uh, many, many people. Anyway, so uh, my wife said, do you know somebody called Joel Cohen? And I knew them a little bit because I had uh, auditioned for Barton Fink. I also know an mm -hmm. accountant named Joel Cohen. <laughs> but I said, Joel Cohen, the accountant? Or Joel Cohen? <laughs> no, Joel Cohen, Joel, anything Cohen. So I get on the, Joel gets on the phone, says, how are you? Fine, fine. He said, listen, you know, we've written this film. It's called A Serious Man. And there's a part in it. And I just have a feeling you'd be really good in this part. Are you interested? I was like, <clears throat> well, uh, yes. <laughs> you know, so let me look at my book. Let me think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I came to New York to read for them. Mm -hmm. read for them and right in the room when I was reading for them uh Ethan said to me uh we're not saying anybody else we want you to do this what oh that's beautiful but and here's the here's the big but he said but oh. we're not sure when we're going to get to this because we're doing three films kind of in the shoot at once simultaneously mm -hmm. and we're not we don't know the order one of them is uh burn after reading 
And if you remember, Burnout After Reading was a big star-studded thing. It has it had uh, 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 Brad Pitt and 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 a lot of big stars in it. So George Clooney, George Clooney, right? Yeah. So we have to do they have we have to do that based on when we can get those stars available. Right. right. So we don't know when we're going to get to a serious man, but we're definitely mm-hmm. going to make it. So meanwhile, I'm like out of money, right? Mm-hmm. I haven't worked. I have like I have like a year's worth of money left before I have to sell my house. Oh. Yeah, it was bad. So he says, I'm not sure when we're going to make it. So a year passes. And I, I, you know how show business works. I think this is one of those things that's just never going to (laughs) happen. And then after 14 months, finally, I get the call and they say, Mm -hmm. we're going to make it. We're going to make it in in Minneapolis. Come to Minneapolis. We're going to make it. And I had a great time making it. I I loved making it. I loved Michael Stuhlbarg and Richard Kind and Sarah Lennox. Everybody was Mm -hmm. in it. It was terrific. And really got to know them well and be friends with them and Mm -hmm. had a marvelous experience. And then I said, well, so how long are you thinking it's going to take to post this? Uh Uh-huh. And I said, well, at least a year. (laughs) So so I was really, by the time it Uh came out, I was really had my back up against the wall. Mm. And then it came out and it was nominated uh, for best picture at the Oscars in 2010. And I was shortlisted for an Oscar, though I didn't get nominated, but I was shortlisted. And then I did win an independent spirit award for it. And then all of a sudden at the age of whatever the hell I was 53 or something, when it came out, uh, I suddenly had this whole second, uh, you know, chapter of my career. And literally since that time, which is now, whatever it is, 13 years ago, 14 years ago, um, you know, I haven't stopped working uh, at t- much to my uh, gratitude and pleasure. Okay, so what was it like during co- when when COVID descended upon us last uh, two March ago? Were you in the middle of something? Did you have something coming up? What were you doing when all of that was starting? I had just finished One Division, mm-hmm. uh, and I had another film that was s- slated to start. Mm-hmm. with this director that I've worked with a bunch of times before, a director I like working with very much mm-hmm. um, called uh, S. Craig Zoller. Uh, but then it was put off because of, uh, you know, the vast uncertainty of things. Right. And initially, you know, there were, there were very, there were very, I don't know if you remember, in the, in the really early days of this thing, there were various opinions. Many people said, oh, it's not going to be so... It's not going to be such a big deal. It's not, you know, it's, it's going to be not so bad. I said, oh my God, they're going to make us stay home for two weeks. Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> and then I had a friend who I was in a movie with, mm-hmm. uh, a guy that I had known for a while. He's an actor called Mark Blum. Oh, you've probably seen him in lots of movies. I know yeah. that name. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you look him up on IMDb, you'll recognize him. Mm-hmm. And my friend said to me, did you hear about Mark Blum? I said, what? He said, he died. I said, from what? He said, this thing, that this thing that people are getting. Oh, I'm this so COVID, sorry. COVID, as we then called it, COVID-19. Right. Because it was still 19, it was still 2019. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, Mark Blum died. And this was shocking because, you know, I thought it was going to be like the flu, like, you know. Right. And then not long after Mark Blum, a woman that I was, that I, uh, there was a director that I went to drama school with, went to Yale drama school with, mm-hmm. called Margaret Holloway, also passed away from it. Wow, sorry. So it was all very, very real. So you asked me what I was doing. Uh, I, I had things scheduled, but they, everything mm-hmm. came to a complete stop. And so what did you do? You said that you didn't do X, Y, and Z. What did you do in that time when we were locked down? Well, because I was very frightened and because things in my marriage were kind of um, mm. not going in a good direction, my son Lee was supposed to have gone to college, mm-hmm. but he didn't want to go and sit in a dorm room and be on Zoom, mm-hmm. you know, and, or sit even at home and be on Zoom like some of his friends. Right. So I said, I will wait a year, take a bye year and just hang out at home. Mm-hmm. So he and I and our other, and, and his brother, my other son, Alec, um, walked every day. And Lee and I decided to go on self-improvement programs. And I lost about 50 pounds and Lee lost over 60 pounds. Oh, my God. You know, I saw a picture of you. And I'm sorry, you lost somebody uh, this week. 
a friend. Yeah, people, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's sort of a strange thing. I posted a picture on Facebook of this friend of mine. I first thought it was your wife and it well, was like, oh, I my God. <laughs> I think I, I think that was my fault. I think a lot of people thought that because it was a mm-hmm. picture of me sort of with my arm around her. And I mm-hmm. said something not very clear. I said something like, you know, she suffered, you know, and I was always in my heart. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of people thought that I'm embarrassed to say that, but she was a, she was a woman that I would, that had been a student of mine at stage door manor when she many years ago. Wow. And in recent years we became, we rekindled our friendship. And last mm-hmm. fall I was in New York, uh, this past fall, uh, doing a movie, which we did, <laughs> which we didn't talk about at all. Uh, we're going to, we're talking about your called, projects called before we person. go. We're, we're going to uh, talk about cat person. And uh, I, she, we talked to each other and I, and I went to visit her in New York. Mm-hmm. So that's when that picture was taken. And uh, she had struggled very valiantly with mental illness and was doing, I thought, really well. Mm-hmm. And she has children, adult children, and a lot of stuff and, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm so sorry. Uh, but she uh, d- died rather unexpectedly of suicide. So um, we were all uh, kind of shocked by the people that were her friends because it, I hadn't seen her for a while. But when I saw her, which was in October, uh, you know, things were good or so I thought. So it was quite shocking to me and to a lot of her friends. But I, did, I think but because of the way I posted it, many people thought that we had a different relationship. I was very confused because you wrote to me and said, I'm single again. And I assumed you were divorced and I made a comment to you about, well, I've done it twice. And then I saw that picture and I was like, oh my God, his wife and died and I'm making I, cracks I, no, about my divorces. Oh my God. No, I think, I think it was, I think, I think you weren't the other, I think it was my fault for being, for not being clearer about that. No, she was just a friend, but you know, a friend that I was obviously, you know, shook up by her passing as many people were, but no, we were just friends. That's all. Um, well, suicide is something also that has, uh, accelerated during the pandemic. I know quite a few cases of, yes. Um, we started, you started asking me, so, so what did I do? So me and Lee, mm-hmm. my son. And you look amazing, by the way. I saw, I, I was like, oh my God, you lost so much weight. Well, you know, I, I wish, I wish I had been, I wish I would have kept up being better about it than I have, but I have to say. You look great. That picture wasn't that long ago. Was no, what, oh, you mean you're talking about the picture that that, that with her that you put that you posted in October. Okay, that's not that no. long ago. No. Yeah, uh, I'm doing okay, but I I I, <laughs> I wish I I wish I were a little more disciplined, to be frank about it. But um, you know, there's much to deal with, and you know, I I I it's sometimes. I mean, I deal with things okay, but in the evening, I I like to have I like to. Uh, uh, What's your guilty pleasure? Come on. Oh, I like to have Sauvignon Blanc and get in bed with somebody nice. That's my guilty pleasure. How's that? <laughs> well, that's not fattening. I'm sorry. You burn calories that way. <laughs> well, I usually eat something beforehand. <laughs> or after. <laughs> um, so you're going to go on. T- so, so we'll, we'll, I don't want to. I was going to ask you if you're going on Tinder or any of that, but forget that. Let's talk about the new project. So cat people. So tell us about what you've got coming up. Uh, okay. Well, there's a few things. Um, I have some things that went on the air already that people can see, but the stuff that hasn't come out yet, I'll tell you about. Um, there's the new season of Barry. I'm so excited. Which I'm in uh, uh, half of the episodes of that season. And I'm also in the next season, which we're starting working on. Uh, Fantastic. I think in May or June of this coming. This, this Wonderful. Uh, um, which I'm really looking forward to people seeing because I love doing it. And it was a great, it's really, I love that show. And I loved it as an audience member. And I love being on it. So there's that. And then there's another show that I didn't know much about, but really love doing um, called The Mysterious Benedict Society. What is that? I saw that in your... Yeah. Do you know who Tony Hale is, the actor? I don't know. Maybe if I saw... I know, I don't know the name. He was on Veep, that show Veep. I did not. Okay. And I love Julia Dreyfus, so there's no excuse. But I no, I don't know that. Tony show. Hale is a wonderful actor, mm-hmm. terrific, talented guy who was on that show and many other things. Very funny guy. Mm-hmm. So at, when that show ended, he had many offers to do different things, and he chose this. Did he play the her assistant? Did he yes. play that real hysterical? I know exactly who he was. Really hysterical. Funny. Hysterical. Really yes. So um, he chose this show. Mm-hmm. And it's from a series of books, which are kids' books, mm-hmm. but they're actually very appealing to adults. And how so? Well, um, 
I can't, I don't, I, without blowing too many of the surprises, I can't exactly mm. explain to you, except to say in the same way that uh, Rocky and Bowinkle is amusing when you're eight is also amusing when you're 58. <laughs> There's some really funny stuff in it. They just, you don't, mm. you don't know what when you're, when you're that, right. old, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> um, it's similarly, very sophisticated mm. writing, very funny. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what it's about is there are these uh, four kids mm-hmm that all come from rather difficult homes Mm -hmm. were all geniuses and they're recruited to leave their families that they, that they are born into and join this, this kind of elite detective force and solve crimes, even though they're about, they range from, I think 11 to 14 years old. They're all very young. So they go that they go and and the, and the man who runs this is this mysterious mm-hmm. man called Mr. Benedict, mm-hmm. uh, who's played by Tony Hale. Also, and, and what's your character? Well, I'll tell you. Okay. Also, Tony Hale also plays the villain. Oh. In this, he's dual roles. He's both characters. So, in this season, the kids go around the world. Mm-hmm. Go around the world on an ocean liner, but it's a kind of a strange world that doesn't exist in our world. It goes most much faster than any ocean liner that we ever have known about. But it looks kind of like a 1920s or 30s ocean liner. It looks surprisingly like the Queen Mary docked down there. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I am the captain of this ship. Mm-hmm. It's called the shortcut. Mm-hmm. And they stow away on the ship so they can get to these various ports that they need to all around the world. Mm-hmm. So my, initially, I know them only as stowaways because we find out that someone has stowed away, some people have stowed away on the ship. But then their goodness, I, I learn of their goodness and of, of their, the, the, what they're tasked with in saving you know, various people. And the show is it's on, I should have explained it's on Disney plus mm-hmm. Disney show beautifully uh, realized Unbel- they, they, they it's, it's wonderful to look at uh, the, the design work is fantastic on it. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, the kids are very, very talented, really, really good. And I was su- surprised uh, working with them at how, skilled they were and also what great people they were these kids mm, young kids and nice terrific kids well i'm sure ann and dylan will be watching it she was the one who asked about wandavision before and she has a son who's age appropriate and what about cat people what's what what's that cat person it was from a cat story. person yeah it's from a story in the new yorker um that was a big success last year a short story mm-hmm. and what it's about is uh a young woman who's about 20 mm-hmm who uh, works at a sort of art house cinema. Mm -hmm. And there's a guy that's maybe 18 years her senior, maybe so, or a guy who comes to the theater all the time. He's like old movie buff. And they begin a relationship, but there's a big age difference. And I don't want to say too much about it besides that, uh, except that it has uh, a fantastic, uh, it, it's, it, it, he becomes obsessed with her. I'll tell you a little bit about it. He becomes obsessed with her and it becomes troubling to her, even though he's much older. And uh, it has a fantastic cast. Um, Amelia Jones, who was in Coda, one of the, 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 is the uh, female lead mm-hmm. in it. Uh, Nick, oh God. <laughs> Again, I should use pictures. Uh, he's he's the star. Well, he's he's. Uh, oh God, this is so horrible. What's the name of the show on on that that my friend Brian is on? Jesus Christ! All right, wait. I'm I'm I'm, I'm opening Google. Go ahead. Uh, hold on. I'll tell you in a second. This is so. I'm, you know, I should know before I before I'm on a show. I should I should have the wherewithal to open up IMDb <laughs> and know my own goddamn shows. Can I? Very embarrassing. Hold okay. on. Okay. I'll do it. All right. This will take me one second. That's okay. Anne, you're going to have to watch. Uh, okay. Tell me the okay. name it's of the, the other one first. 
The other what? The other show? The 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 Mysterious the Benedict Society. Sir, okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So this this movie that I did in New mm -hmm. York stars Amelia Jones and Nicholas Braun. So Nicholas Braun, do you know who Nicholas Braun is? I don't think I do. He plays. Uh, he's known, mostly known for um, Succession. Oh, I love Succession. He, he plays Wait. Greg on Succession. Okay. Yes, he's fabulous. I love Yeah, him. he's terrific. It's an unbelievable yeah. cast. Yeah. Um, Isabella Rossellini. Oh, wow. Yeah, I fulfilled a lifelong fantasy of Isabella Rossellini's. <laughs> <laughs> um, did, did, you ever seen, did you ever seen with Isabella? I'm not at liberty to say. Okay. <laughs> Hope Davis is in this. Well, you know Hope Davis, wonderful I actress. Do. Michael Gandolfini. You know who he is. I do. I absolutely do. Uh, Geraldine Viswanathan, who I was in another movie with. Uh, a really terrific cast. And the director, mm -hmm. a woman called Susanna Fogel. Uh, mm -hmm. I worked with another in another movie about, I guess, about five years ago or so, um, which we made in Europe. Um, you see me struggling to remember the name of it. <laughs> God damn it, I can't remember anything. It was a big hit. I'll you know. tell you in a second. Hold on. I always say I forgot to take my ginkgo today. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm not the only one. I do this all. I'm talking on the phone. And I'm going... I'm telling the person I can't find my phone. I yeah, don't the, know where my phone is. <laughs> yeah, but these are these are these are movies that I'm in that I work on. For yeah, months. but it doesn't matter. I mean, because we're we're the spy who know. dumped me is the name of that film that I couldn't. Okay. Remember. okay. <laughs> also, you asked me what people can see that I'm in. I forgot to say. Okay, so here are things. Some things that are on the air already. I was in a film. I mean, a series called American Crime Story. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, which was all about Monica Lewinsky and Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. um, that's still on. You can still get that. Mm -hmm. um, I play uh, Bill Ginsburg, who was Monica Lewinsky's attorney in that wonderful, great role, which I enjoyed doing tremendously, who is kind of at sea. He, he, uh, he's a malpractice lawyer mm -hmm. uh, who seizes the opportunity to become a national star, or so he thinks, uh -huh. uh, a real person who really lived. Um, and, How much uh, did you model it after the real person? Well, he's dead. I never met him, mm -hmm. but I watched him uh, on uh, YouTube. Mm -hmm. I didn't particularly model his his style of speech or anything like that, but there was a certain hubris about him uh, that seemed very appropriate to the character as it was written, and it was mm -hmm. and, uh, that certainly was from him, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What else you got? Somebody, as Tony just said, is Fred Googling himself? I said, no, you're on IMDb, aren't you? Right. So, so that's what I have that's coming out. The, the, mm -hmm. Those three things are the things that I have that's coming out that haven't yet come out. I also am on I'm an animated show called Epis for Family this past season, but that's already out. So people probably know about that. Are you still doing voiceover work? Do you do that? Occasionally. Mm -hmm. Occasionally I do it when there, I don't do a lot of it, but I do when there's, when there's uh, something, you know, worth doing. So Barry, though, coming, we're coming up that you're about to dive into will be another season of Barry. Yes, Barry starts uh, in April, at the end of April, uh, and I'm on the, the uh, half of the season of that. And they'll all No, but I mean, so you're going to start doing the following oh, doing, yes. season. Yeah, yeah I'm going to start oh, working on it. Yes. Yeah. yeah that I think we're going to start that in May, I believe, either May or early June. We're going to start the, the next, the fourth season of Barry. Mm-hmm. So and like, so, so Fred, before we go, uh, I'm going to ask you just something with your voice. But before we do that, so at this stage of life, being single again, um, the apps are all uh, forget it, uh, COVID did, did away with the apps. I think I don't I don't think people do that anymore. But how is it to dating apps? You mean? Yeah. How is it meeting oh, people? Huge. <laughs> are, are they huge? Actually, my daughter met her boyfriend during COVID on an app and they're together two years and happy as clams. But do you is that still a thing? I think it's still a thing. Yeah. It's still a thing. Yeah. And, and is it because, all right, it's a pandemic and there are people like me who are still COVID crazy. How is it? How, how do you, how do you do that in this world of, Oh my God, does she have COVID? Oh my God. Do you test somebody before you go out on a date? I mean, how cautious are you or not at all? 
Well, I mean, it depends on how many how how many partners you have. I mean, if you're if you're uh, there, you know, uh, there are some people who are more worried about it than other people. Mm -hmm. So uh, some people might be very protective about it and want you to be tested all the time, or some people mm -hmm. are not. Um, I think it depends on, uh, you know, if you're obviously if you're having multiple uh, partners, then that's different. Mm -hmm. um, but I would think it's harder to meet people now because so many people are still mostly home. I mean, not so uh, a lot. Very few people are mostly home. Well, mo most of the people watching this show are mostly home, <laughs> including me. But, but uh, yes, I guess we're, we're a min minority at this yeah, point. Yeah, I mean, but... people that work, that, that have mm -hmm. to work or that do work, I mean, the vast majority have gone back to work. There are some people that work from home, obviously. A lot of people work from home. I work from home. I know a lot of people that work from home. My kids both work from home. One for a law firm, one's, one for a start. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people who have adjusted who have but I mean if you go out you know restaurants are at full speed there's no there's, there's when you go to the supermarkets they're full of people Costco mm -hmm. is full of people it's not mm -hmm. people are you know that may change if we if these variants if this uh, this current variant turns out to be as as stealthy and as powerful as people are worried that it's going to be well London is a mess and uh yeah it's kind of a mess over there so it can it possibly not get here I don't know if that's even conceivable I mean I guess it's possible but anyway oh. um before we go will you say your infamous words for us um in a world I, I'm not going to do it but I'm going to ask you to do it you're from in a world your word that your 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 vocalization of those words is just I always, those words yeah well that's what I hear whenever I say your name I hear those words in my head I don't know I just do well that was but, you know that was I was in that the guy that really made those words famous was Don LaFontaine not me mm -hmm. but Don LaFontaine uh who has now been dead for gosh, maybe 15 years, 14 years, I don't know, something like that. But he was the actual in a world guy. And then there was another guy, uh, kind of an East Coast uh, guy that also did it. But Don LaFontaine was the famous person. But he, he had this unusual quality of both being dramatic, but not being uh, sort of James Earl Jonesy. He had this kind mm. of rawness in a world. But that's too, that's too, that's <laughs> overdone. In a world, in a world. That? I love it's perfect. Um, Fred, thank you so much for doing this. I so enjoy sitting down and spending time with you. And My I hope pleasure. again, the next time we do it, it'll be in the same room and um, good luck with all your projects. And I am so excited to watch you and Barry. I absolutely can't wait. And um, thank you so much. Healthy. It's been a pleasure. And I, and I look forward to seeing you again. And I look forward to getting together in the room like we used to with all the people sitting there and all that. That would be terrific. Absolutely. Oh, women who write. Absolutely. We will right. do that again. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for doing this. Take care, Fred. Bye-bye. I, I can do this. I can, I can make us go 